excited to welcome you here to the kickoff event for the MIT Summit on the Grand Challenges in Information Science and Scholarly Communication. We have, with generous funding from the Mellon Foundation, our goal for this summit <coughs> is to identify and prioritize specific grand challenges in each of three targeted areas of information sciences and scholarly communications. Those three targeted areas are scholarly discovery, digital curation and preservation, and open scholarship. The identification of central questions within each challenge area will pave the way for building an information science and scholarly communications research agenda for the community. The summit will establish connections between stakeholders and innovators and scholars and practitioners from across disciplines and across the sector and we're hoping will also lead to future collaboration. For each of the challenge areas, we've gathered a diverse group of domain experts who will dig in deep over the next day and a half and develop consensus around the most important grand challenges in each of the specific areas. Each of our day and a half workshops is gonna start with a keynote address, and this morning's keynote opens our session on scholarly discovery. I want to note that all of our keynotes will be live streamed, and this morning, and uh, they're all available on our website at grandchallenges.mit.edu. We also hope that it will be live tweeted, and our hashtag is MIT Grand Challenges. I do want to note that since we are being live streamed, any questions or comments after the keynote will also be on the live stream. So. Um, by uh, coming up to the mic, uh, you are consenting to being live streamed. So let's get started. Um, as many of you know, due to personal circumstances, Dr. Carla Hayden, the Librarian of Congress, was not able to be with us this morning. Um, but our good fortune is that we have with us instead Kate Zward. <clears throat> and Kate is the Director of Digital Strategy at the Library of Congress. She is working collaboratively, whew, that's a tough word to say on a live stream. Kate is the Director of Digital Strategy at the Library of Congress, where she is working collaboratively across the institution and with other partners to figure out how to use technology in libraries to help people become the best versions of themselves. Kate has a very people-focused approach to the work that she's doing with the Library of Congress. Last year, her group launched LC Labs, a small team designed to in incubate innovative projects and be an inviting human interface to LC's digital services. Kate started at the library as an engineering manager for a team building tools for the digital library. Please join me in welcoming Kate Zouard to open our summit. Thank you, everybody, and thanks, Chris, for that really kind introduction. Uh, it's an honor to be here talking to such an amazing group of people, and it's a real joy to be here at MIT. Um, I've never been here before, and I don't think any of my family has ever been here before either, but when I was a kid, I read about this place the way I imagine space travelers will read about a home world they've never visited, um, so it's really thrilling. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to tell you one quick story about a snowy evening. Um, about 15 years ago, I uh, just moved to DC, um, and the person I was dating was living in Philadelphia. And it was a really sad and hard time for both of us. We were both a little bit lonely and scared. Um, and for a treat, I booked us tickets for an Indigo Girls concert in Philadelphia. And that was about an hour, a little more of an hour's drive for each of us in opposite directions so that we could see each other on a weeknight. Um, it was a terrible weather that day. Uh, it was freezing rain, and my windshield kept freezing over, um, and I kept passing accidents on the way up, but I was young enough and foolish enough just to keep going. Uh, and when we got there, it all felt worth it. The venue was amazing, it was packed, the energy was incredible. Um, and a little bit after the start time, um, a, man came to the po a man came to the stage, and it, he was, we had such terrible seats, he was just a little speck, you know, just a, just a mode of a person. And he comes to the mic and he says, thank you all for coming, it's such a great crowd. And we all cheer, woo! 
and he says, you made it through the snow. You made it through the ice. You made it through the terrible weather to be here. And we all cheer, cheer, woo! And he said, it's so great that you could come here through this terrible weather. Unfortunately, the Indigo Girls couldn't make it. <laughs> and we laugh, because it sounds like a joke. Uh, but he was like, no, I'm serious. Uh, it's time, time for you to go. They're, not, they're really not coming. And so we all kind of like just sadly packed up our things and, and wandered out. Um, and it was a terrible night, but I kind of, <laughs> <laughs> I thought about, um, when um, I heard from Chris, I thought about that night. And I thought about, what if that little moat had said, that's the bad news. But the good news is, and he pulls a guitar out from behind him <laughs> and says, I'm here, and I've been practicing some songs on the weekends that you might want to hear. Um, so all that to say, you probably have noticed by now that I'm not actually Dr. Carla Hayden. Um, she sends her regrets. She really wishes she could make it. She's just still feeling a little bit under the weather. Um, but she sent me, and I'm really happy to talk to you about some things we've been working on under Carla's direction. Um, she's really brought a sense of energy and invigoration to the, to the team. Um, and so um, I'll, I hope you enjoy it. So the Library of Congress is a weird and big place. Um, I've been there for about six years, and I'm still sort of wrapping my head around it. And before I talk to you about things we all have in common, which is actually my favorite part, I do want to tell you a little bit about the institution um, to give you sort of a sense of our um, challenges and incentives. Um, the Library of Congress, which is America's library, is the largest library that's ever existed on planet Earth and probably the solar system. <laughs> I don't know. Um, uh, we have 164 million items on approximately 838 miles of shelves. That includes 240 million books. It has the world's largest collection of maps, music scores, legal material, films, sound recordings, comic books, and telephone directories, 124,000 telephone directories. And those kind of numbers are not um, really conducive to human understanding, right? Our, ba our brains are not evolved to really grok that. So I want to dig in a little bit deeper to each one of those things. Um, so this is a picture of the stacks in the Geography Manuscripts Division. Um, like I said, it's the largest maps collection in the world, 5.5 million maps. Um, you can walk for two football fields um, through, the through, the, through the stacks. Um, and it almost has a vanishing point, uh, you know, it's like, really. Um, there are so many maps that, they, that not all of them have been cataloged, and indeed, there's no written record for some of them. They're just, um, they're organized um, spatially, but they're organized in lo their spatial location by topical location, and that's how we navigate those maps. Um, we have the world's largest collection of recorded sound in the world on wax cylinders, vinyl, lacquer discs, of radio broadcasts, including tens of thousands of World War II radio broadcasts. Um, of jazz recordings, including Ella Fitzgerald's uh, artist collection. I love this picture. Isn't this incredible? I should mention that most of the things that, most of the pictures that I'll show today are from our collections. Um, there's a picture of my kid in there that's not in the collections. <laughs> so don't get confused. Um, and, and including uh, original field recordings of American music and folklore. The largest collection of manuscripts in the world. The papers of the members of Congress alone are, t are 900 collections. Uh, the papers of 23 presidents from George Washington to Calvin Coolidge, papers from the NAACP, the National Women's Suffrage Association, the Urban League, and others, personal papers of Susan B. Anthony, Frederick Douglass, Margaret Mead, Benjamin Franklin, Robert Oppenheimer, Alexander Graham Bell, Sigmund Freud, the Wright brothers, John Van Neumann, Claude Shannon, Rosa Parks, and Gaucho Marx. Last year, we responded to one million reference requests in person and online, and circulated almost a million tangible items. It's big and it's growing. So um, one of the ways that we grow our collection is through the US copyright um, demand and deposit system. Um, uh, and through the copyright program, we accession 11,000 uh, tangible items to the library every week. And that, for reference, is the size of my hometown library. And those numbers don't touch the digital library, which is really big, too. Um, last year, we created 4.7 million files through digitization. We added an, addi an additional 36 million files to the digital collection. And that number doesn't include the 1 million digitized historic newspapers we added through our historic partnership with the National Endowment for the Humanities. 
we collected 1.5 million electronic journal articles and added 730 million documents crawled from the web. Um, and what I want to convey with this is a sense that this is our normal operating conditions. So a huge amount of our resources are spent just in the um, making the machine maintain. Um, and all the things that I mentioned are in ser service to just one of our strategic goals. Um, acquire, preserve, and provide access to a universal collection of knowledge and the record of America's creativity. That's big, but it doesn't touch all the other things that we do. We provide service to Congress through the um, Congressional Research Service. We provide legal support to the federal government through the law library and our program to um, serve accessible books to the blind and physically handicapped and more. Um, so there's a lot. And this um, strategic goal in particular is um, it's expansive. <laughs> um, I think that's kind of an understatement. It's, it's a lot to chew on. Um, <laughs> and I, um, as the library's first digital strategy director, um, it can feel overwhelming, this mission statement. Um, and I feel a great sense of urgency about it sometimes. That's not always helpful. Uh, at my last performance review, my boss's only um, constructive criticism was that I need to stop f showing so much feeling on my face in meetings. Um, <laughs> And he's right, and that's why I don't play poker, because I really have a very expressive face, and I would love to not have that. So I asked him, well, how do you do that? And he said, um, you need to stop feeling things. <laughs> and I actually thought that was really good advice the more I thought about it. Um, I learned to start to think of our work as inevitable. Um, even though it's not, I need to feel that way. And I, need to think, I think about it now more like an exothermic reaction uh, but that needs a catalyst. And I love chemistry and I will sneak this into all my slide decks until the rest of you love this chemistry as much as I do. Um, so uh, as we all remember for chemistry class, exothermic reactions are spontaneous, but not if they need an activation energy like this one. Um, and um, I, I really wanted to do a demonstration, um, so I was gonna bring a bottle, like a, a Coke bottle of Mentos, but they, um, Chris told me no explosions in the building, so. Um, and I think of our work in labs as being that catalyst, right? As being that thing that gets us over that hump so we can slide down the hill. Um, this is me and my team of folks um, uh, on the launch day of LC Labs in last September. It's really hard to believe it's not been quite a year yet because it's been just a packed and really amazing time. Um, so we started it as a place um, for experimentation um, and to have a mechanism by which we could help the library thoughtfully engage um, the community of practitioners and researchers. Um, and I want to talk about our work in labs today in the context of the scale that I mentioned earlier. Um, part of what I wanted to convey with those numbers is how big the library is as a machine, right, uh, that has inputs and outputs. And um, it takes an enormous amount of energy and effort to process all that material, um, an enormous amount of uh, people who have devoted their lives to this work. And enormous and delicate machines like this are not Agile, they can't be. I mean, they can't. It's uh, they'll break. Um, so the library carved out a corner. Um, we sometimes talk about labs as a protected space, like this is the space that's special and that's innovative. Uh, but I actually think it's the opposite. We create labs to protect the important work of the rest of the library, to reduce the impact to change to this enormous delicate machine that we need to keep running, um, to so that we can get some evidence on what works and what's safe. Um, and, and people, one of the criticisms I've had of labs is that people think it's just for play, it's just play time and it's not serious and that we need to be focused on the real challenges that lie ahead for the library. And I'd like to argue that um, actually labs is how we do that, it's the mechanism by which we uh, make that happen. Trying things in a way that's easy and cheap is really the only way to move forward. And that brings me to my long con. So we have to agree just to keep this between us, okay, because this is kind of a secret. Um, <laughs> Uh, the long con is central to what I think of as the what is the point question about labs. Um, and when, when, we're work, when we're working in, our, in labs and we're thinking about what, what to do next, I judge everything by two criteria. Is it feasible and what is the impact? Um, and I think there are broadly two ways we can have impact. We can try something out that we want to put into production. And a great example of that is crowdsourcing, and I'll get to that in a minute. But another, even more interesting kind of way, a way we can have impact, um, to me, is demonstrating how the digital collection has properties inherent in it 
that enable new kinds of research, especially combined with the tools of computation, that uh, present new and exciting research possibilities. And that means demonstrating to our staff while, why putting resources into bulk data and APIs is important. And it also means demonstrating to researcher what's, researchers what's possible with the collections. And that's the kind of thinking that I hope to evoke with our work in labs. Um, and in my new job, with a broader mandate, um, using the tools of labs to think about implementation. Um, and especially how labs can help us deal with the problem of scale, or the challenge of scale. And how technology can help us reach more users and think about the mountain of information we're responsible for collecting, storing, and organizing. So with that in mind, I'd like to tell you about a few of the things we're working on. This is kind of the fun stuff, I think. Um, so uh, we wanted to help people use our information in computational ways. Um, before we started, there were a bunch of APIs and bulk data sources throughout, scattered throughout the library that we were that the library was really proud of. The people who worked on them really um, thoughtfully built these things. Um, but if you were a person who wants to make stuff with things from the Library of Congress, there was no central point to go to. So we uh, built uh, LC for robots. Um, um, actually, my daughter and I collaborated on that needle point in the corner. Uh, um, so um, we also added a bunch of documentation. We added um, uh, GitHub, uh, sorry, tutorials and Jupyter Notebooks on GitHub. And I, I know a lot of you know what Jupyter Notebooks are, but um, for those of you who don't, um, I would like to go in a little more detail about that. Um, so this is a Jupyter Notebook we have um, explaining how you can go through the API to download, download World War I sheet music uh, front page images. Um, so Jupyter Notebooks are an open source web application that allows you to create and share documents that contain live code, visualization, and narrative text. So the neat thing about it is you, you can explain what you're doing along with the running code that actually does that thing. Um, and the beauty of Jupyter Notebooks is, is you can grab this and make some changes to some variables and get a whole different output. So it lets people play with the API without doing all the coding from scratch. And I also think this is sort of a con too because um, some people don't, like command lines can be intimidating for some people. But if you show them a web page instead that you can change some variable names on, it's not programming even though it is. Uh, anyway, I think it's fun. Um, Um, but as we all know, it's not enough to throw some resources on a web page and hope that people use them. We've got to invite them intentionally, but also through other programs. And we were really inspired by the National Endowment for the Humanities Chronicling America Data Challenge. So um, in partnership with NEH, the Library of Congress puts um, digitized historic newspapers online. We have, I think, 12, 12 million available right now. And NEH ran a data challenge through challenge.gov inviting people to make um, new visualizations, new web applications with that data. And it was really neat. They got a bunch of really cool scholarship that came out of it, but also the press around it and the, um, the, um, the talking around it was also really helpful. So people thought about um, how this corpus of data might be useful to their research interests. So um, this year we launched a congressional data challenge so as part of our special relationship with Congress, at the Library of Congress, we provide um, the congress.gov service, uh, which is you know, legislative uh, information, including bills, laws. Um, and we are asking people to think creatively about what that information could be used for. Um, so we'd like for people to make maybe a visualization or an, an app. Um, and um, we're giving some prize money, $5,000 to the winner and $1,000 to the best high school or below. Um, project, so uh, please tell your friends because it's open until April 2nd, so still time to end, enter. Um, when we started LAMPS, one of the things we wanted to do was invite people in to do creative projects for short-term stays. So we started an innovator in residence project. Um, and to sort of test out the concept, in the first year, we did it as a staff assignment. So we advertised on our staff page. Um, anybody from the Library of Congress could apply and spend three months with us making something. And uh, we selected two applicants, um, Tong Long and Chris Adams. And this was Chris's project. So Chris wanted to work on crowdsourcing. I'm sorry, this was Tong's project. Tong wanted to work on crowdsourcing. Um, he created this Beyond Words um, crowdsourcing application, which we launched as a pilot. You can go see it on labs.loc.gov right now. Um, it uses the Scribe platform, a project by New York Public Library and Zooniverse, with support from the National Endowment for the Humanities. And it invites people to mark and transcribe images and digitize historic newspapers and peer review the work of others. 
The obvious benefit of this for me is inviting people to poke through collections that they would not have ordinarily done, right? So they're like looking at historic newspapers and reading it and interacting with it. Um, but also, um, it gets us a gallery of searchable images. So you can look at cartoons by a, a particular artist, for example. And more fun and yummy data for digital humanities projects in the form of the, the JSON output that we give. But I think more importantly, it gave us a way to try out a new type of crowdsourcing at the library that we hadn't done before. So um, we, we've done crowdsourcing at the library for a long time through the Flickr uh, Commons project. So I think we've actually just hit our 10 year anniversary with, with that project. So the library puts prints and photographs um, on Flickr and invites people to comment and um, staff members interact with those people and sometimes glean information that gets added to our catalog. Uh, but that's very labor intensive and heavily curated. And uh, we wanted to explore what a less rich but more voluminous sort of crowdsourcing would look like um, and, and, this, and see how it would work in our environment. Um, and practically, it gave us, um, it helped us out when Dr. Hayden came to us and said, I want to start a really robust and big program for crowdsourced transcription of collections. Uh, we were already ready with a proposal because we'd been thinking about it. Uh, and this is um, some wireframes for what this is going to look like. We're in active sprints right now, um, hoping to launch in September. And what we're hoping to build is a platform for transcription of, of any collection. Uh, that's an image of text. And um, we're, we're hoping to make it in a way that's usable by other cultural heritage organizations. So keep an eye out on the Library of Congress GitHub page, um, because the repo should be up on that shortly. Um, so I mentioned the Innovator in Residence program. For our second year in 2017, we wanted to have somebody who wasn't a, a staff member. Um, and so we um, talked with Jer Thorpe, who I, and I still cannot believe that, that this uh, agreed to come to the library for six months to do something. Um, but to make an engaging piece of art around Library of Congress collections and data as data. Um, and I'll, I'll let Jer introduce himself. Uh, as part of his work, he's doing a podcast called Artist in the Archive, that if you find this talk interesting at all, the podcast is even better. So please um, take, a, uh, take a listen to that. Jerry's been super fun to work with. He, um, one of the reasons that we were so thrilled that he agreed to work with us uh, is that he's worked, done a lot of work for co co other cultural heritage organizations. 
And also his work focuses sometimes on scale and in making that scale understandable to people and also meaningful. Um, and I think that's one of the things we struggle to tell as part of our story. Um, uh, I'd like to talk to you about a few of the things um, he, he's made while he's been with us. Um, among the very great, man, um, among the manuscript collections that we have of MIT alumni, um, including one of my favorites, Vannevar Bush, are the personal papers of Edward Lorenz. Um, and I included the screenshot uh, because I really like the disambiguation at the top, because I, too, have confused Edward Norton with Edward Lorenz. So if that's helpful for you, they're not the same person. Um, <clears throat> in 1963, Lorenz published a paper, Deterministic Non-Periodic Flow, that showed that certain kinds of systems are very, very sensitive to small changes in their initial conditions. Um, and as, as we all know, this is why we don't know much about the weather two weeks from now, because Small differences in atmospheric conditions have lar uh, can cause large variations over time. Uh, Lorenz called this the butterfly effect. Uh, one of the neat things about the Lorenz papers is that they show, they illustrate how computation, how machine computation affected the field of mathematics over time. Um, so you can look through his papers and see, um, in the beginning, there are graphs of handmade calculations. And at the end, they have, um, computer programs that do these simulations. And actually, Jer and um, our senior manuscript um, archivist, Kathleen O'Neill, were able to get some of these going using uh, some of the forensic uh, toolkits in our preservation division. It was really neat. Um, Lorenz's model, called the Lorenz attractor, outputs this compelling structure, which Jer says looks oddly like a butterfly. And he says, as we watch the butterfly, I'm quoting him now. It's when we watch that butterfly emerge, though, by setting the system free to animate over time, that we get a real sense of the beauty of the Lorenz, Lorenz attractor. We see how it lives through long periods of regularity, where we start to recognize a pattern, all seemingly at random, a switch course or change direction. Shifting gears a bit, he continues, I want you to imagine for a second that the room you're in is filled with words, every word in the English language floating in space. Over there by the door is a cluster of fruit words, pear and apple and orange and kumquat. Right under your chair are all the synonyms for love. Above your head are hopes and dreams and imagination. Proper nouns are here as well. The presidents are uh, near the window, um, just beside all the countries and states and provinces and cities. And there's New York in the center of all. Hey, I didn't write the algorithm. If you look back at the cluster of fruits by the door, you can see the apple is closest to New York, drawn in by so many pop culture references. Jer sets the attractor loose in this conceptual space, a room with three million English language words and their relationships. And he uses the attractor to build a connected series of words, one that would change dramatically every time he reruns it with different parameters uh, because of the nature of the chaotic model. Um, and it results in something like a poem. And I'd like to re read you a short excerpt. I, I'm sorry. I'd like to read you a short excerpt. This variable. Variable spell imported of this variable talks. Yes, younger. Younger genius. Of classification and this competitive supply. Classification. This competitive, competitive spell. Reply the symbolic reporting. Reply the specialty. The reporting of the transaction. Fly the travel and the objection of the ranking match fly. Word spheres supply the demand, supply motives, feeling, proceeding, classification. Supply these announcements, these announcements competitive, boring statements. This work asks us, I think this work asks, asks us how we could um, put serendipity back into the library. Um, and also into the web. Um, how, he asks how we could make surfing possible again. Um, back you know, when the web was young, we talked about surfing all the time. And that's, that word has sort of fallen out of favor, he says. Um, um, how do we enable our users to be carried off by curiosity, not to a particular destination? Uh, the library is really big. And we've optimized it over time um, so that we can answer specific research questions. Um, that's how we deal with the scale. Um, but we can think differently now. Um, we, can, we can help wanderers. Um, we're a closed stack library. But how do we think about, how does we let, di I mean, 
So in the physical space, you can't wander the stacks. But in the digital space, you can. And you can do that now through searching on lsc.gov or um, poking through finding aids. But I think there's more that we could do there. Um, and it inspires me to think about how we could be warm and welcoming to people who are interested in knowing more, but they don't particularly care about what. Last year, the Library of Congress released 25 million bibliographic records that describe our holding. Jer mentioned that in um, his, the excerpt from his podcast. Um, and he's been exploring about what data he could, he's been exploring what data he could extract that's not immediately obvious in the records, or at least uh, using data that contains the records in non-conventional ways. In this app, um, Jared pulls 20 author names whose works were published in a given year, in this case, 1800 and invites you to imagine them in a dinner party at a specific moment in time. So here we have Arthur William Christoph, George, another Christoph, David Thomas, George, Luigi Richard, another Thomas Carl, another William Henry, another Henry, Johann Robert, Richard, Anthony, and Leonard. And by changing the parameter in the top, going to 2010, we get a different picture. We get Andrea, Jim, Jill, Francis, Enrico, Laurent, James, Maria, Johanna, Alessandro, Robert, Paul, Caroline. Um, and it really, it, I think it exposes how bibliographic uh, information can give us a window into the humanity of authors. But also, it paints a vivid portrait of the changing demographic of authors that were published and in the collection just by, um, you know, just by sampling that data set. I mean, I, I think we could do that with charts and graphs, but this, what I love about this piece is it really invites you to think about it more viscerally. Um, in this app that he's made called the Library of Color, he takes the titles of works from the bibliographic records and matches them to a crowdsourced database of color, color words that are matched with color space. It's a, it was an X, XKCD project, if those of you, for those of you who are familiar with it. Um, besides being beautiful, it gives us another entry point into the collections. And um, I, inv I invite you to try this um, at home. In the cor top corner, um, that drop-down list lets you select just fiction, just nonfiction, and you can see how words we use to describe color change depending on the work. Jared looked at the, libra the library's name authority records, which we use to give consistent reference to people. Um, some of those records contain information about when and where people were born. So um, we can use it to look at trends in cultural centers and migration patterns. What we're looking at here is a screenshot from, uh, screenshot from a sketch he's built to look at the data more, more closely. Um, if you look at the website, it's actually a video, but I don't do live demos. I've been a software developer for a long time, and so I've learned that the hard way. Uh, so this is just a picture, but I encourage you to look at it on the website. It's really cool. Um, Oswald von Wolkenstein was an Italian poet, a diplomat, a composer, famous for his polyphonic works. Andrew Wyeth McCoy was a painter, pianist, and composer. Paolo Vanzellini was a Brazilian herpetologist and samba composer. And these are just a few of the polymaths that Jay was able to find in our collections. Um, and the way he did it, I think was really neat. He mapped the occupations of the people in the name authorities uh, and uh, clustered them by similarity. And then he used physical distance to see how far people traveled to do uh, between herpetology and samba composing, for example. Um, if you're interested in following his work, I have details in the end. And in 2018, we'll be doing our first open call for innovator in residence. Um, this year, we'll be, foc we'll be um, targeting uh, data journalists who are interested in using our collections and data to tell different kinds of stories. Um, Laura Rubel is a software development librarian from um, George Washington University, and she was with us for a few months on research leave. Um, she really helped us in documenting our API, and she also made a few things with it that I'd like to show you. Um, this is her, the first app she made. Uh, she made it with Glitch. Um, it's called Library Congress Colors, and it examines uh, images in the prints and photo photograph collection by collection and uh, pulls out swatches of each item to show the dominant colors in the work. Um, and I thought maybe we'd play together. Does that sound fun? So this one, each one of these um, little uh, chunks is one item. 
And it, it, this collection is either baseball cards, cartoons and drawings, Japanese fine prints, Sanborn maps, WPA posters, or World War I posters. Anybody got a guess? WPA, that's the, that's the guess. Let's see. Yes, nice, nice. OK, one more. Um, so these are either baseball cards, cartoons and drawings, Japanese fine prints, Sanborn maps, or World War I posters. I hear World War I. It's not World War I. Not Japanese fine prints. It's baseball cards. Uh, Laura is incredible. She, um, when she left, she printed these images on fabric and made bags from them. And I am really inspired. I, brought, I actually brought mine. Um, it's just so cool. Um, it, it inspires me to think about different kinds of making and the different kinds of making that we can make possible by um, opening up our collections. Uh, it's so, so neat. Um, this is another thing she made. It's called Photo Roulette. Um, it lets you browse the photo collections in the form of a game where you guess the date of a photograph from the Prince of Photographs collection. And this is a remix of an app by Tim Sherratt that invites people to guess the year of headlines in Australian news. Um, you want to play this one? All right. Anybody guess the year of this? I have 42. It's a little earlier than 42. 23? It's a later than 23. I hear 36. It was 35. You get, you get the prize of nothing. Right. <laughs> um, and when I play this, it links back to the collection. And I tend to get lost in it, which is the point. It's just another entryway to invite people in to learn more and to experience. Um, we're also thinking about how we're collecting born digital material to serve new types of researcher, research needs. Um, uh, I like to say libraries aren't book holes, right? They're not like places where we drop books. And they're also not data holes. We, um, we selectively acquire to support research. And in the tangible world, it was very easy to imagine the kind of research need we were collecting for. But that's, I think that's less true now, because research methodologies are evolving faster than um, we can imagine them, right? Um, people are on the cutting edge, and we're still thinking about what's happening today. Um, and I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to talk about a use case that I think illustrates this. Um, in 2016, we asked Michelle Gallinger and Dan Chudnoff to consider how we might expand our support for digital humanities scholarship with our existing assets. Um, among other things, they did a small proof of concept, a tracer bullet. Um, if you're not familiar with the tracer bullet concept in software development, it's when you take a, a tiny piece of the solution, a really narrow slice, and go from beginning to end. Instead of engineering um, a whole chunk of the problem, um, you wiggle your way through it, and you leave, your spell, save, uh, you leave yourself a space to walk through it. Um, if anybody's got another analogy for that, I'd love to hear it, because it's not, it's so evocative, but I'd like something that's less, you know, less you know. Um, <laughs> so um, they decided to see what it would be like to do some computational analysis on web archives. Um, and what they planned to do was make edge lists with a group of web, web archives to, to, supplore, to explore the relationship between links. Um, and what they found was the format that we collect web archives in, works is not optimized for that purpose. Um, and that's not surprising. Um, the goal of the web archiving program, which is, was started almost 20 years ago, before this kind of research was commonplace, um, was to create an archival copy or a snapshot of a site, how a site appeared at a particular point in time, not to create data for analysis. Um, and it really illustrates to me um, how different use cases affect how we can collect, how we should collect and store information. And it shows the complexity of this problem space. Our collection pra practices are influenced both by what we want to collect and how we should be collecting them. And more stuff in labs is coming. Um, so we're partner partnering with JSTOR Labs, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, and Wikimedia Wikidata, Wikidata to uh, have a week-long flash build to take place in uh, DC in the week of July 9th. Our goal is to build, in the end, 
um, sorry, our goal is to end the week with a working prototype of a new tool or visualization uh, focusing on baseball to, ally, to align with a, a baseball exhibit that's going to happen in the Thomas Jefferson building if you're around in the summertime um, uh, because the All-Star game is coming. Hmm. All-Star game, people like that. Um, and uh, we're working on a machine learning experimentation around identifying place names in our photographs. Um, and we are hosting a number of workshops. So IIIF in uh, May, Hathi Trust Research Center workshop in August, and a Daria workshop in October. So lots of stuff. So what does any of this have to do with scale? Um, I propose that the library has done pretty well with scale, but that we need to do even more and that piloting, iterating, and trying things is how we get better. And inviting people to use our services and talking about them is the fastest way we can improve. Um, and this is how we're going to use labs to define and implement a digital strategy for the agency. We use evidence, we use experience, and we use friendship. And outside of labs, we continue to build. Um, for the past 11 years, the size of our digital collection has doubled every 32 months. I'm very calm about it, you guys, very <laughs> calm. Uh, so uh, build is part of what we do every day. We're like the dozers in Fraggle Rock, except nobody is eating it, which I'm very grateful for. Um, and we're, we've published an aggressive digital collecting plan, which we, will add new dimensions and formats to our collecting process. Um, there's a link to that in the um, resources as well. Um, it's pretty, pretty good reading. Um, so. Another thing that we're thinking about, and really led by Carla Hayden's strong direction in this, in this um, regard, is thinking about how the library is, can become a place of warmth and welcome. And that starts with our intentions. And as I was reading, excuse me, <clears throat> as I was reading the MIT Future of Libraries Task Force report, that is what really struck me, is this sense of um, wanting to be a place of welcome and warmth. Um, and uh, I was really inspired by it. Um, we are thinking about that in various ways. And I think one of the ways is in our physical experience. So right now, if you're a researcher, you go to one part of the building. And if you're a visitor, you go to another part. And you can look at the researchers literally through, through glass, like it's an aquarium. And um, we want to break those down, right? We want to think about learners and researchers and makers of knowledge as sort of like along a spectrum of abilities and um, interests. and. Um, we're thinking about that also for the digital collections. So in the new visitor's experience, we're developing plans to integrate a digital environment, allowing visitors to engage, interpret, and collaborate with the LOC's digital collections. And part of the conception, and this is very conceptual right now, is you know machines that are for professional use, but then machines that are for people who are interested in just dabbling and understanding. Um, I think when people come to visit the library, what they see is, um, a monument to knowledge, but they don't see a living, breathing organization. They don't see what libraries are, what they could become, and I'd love to find a way to convey that to people. Um, and being warm and inviting, I think, is uh, partly done with human meat. Um, like literally here today, right? I want to tell you that the library is yours. Um, it's for you. Uh, you've, you know, those of you who are uh, in the United States taxpayers, you've paid for it. Um, and if you come, I will show you around. Um, I, I want you to feel like it, it's a place that you, that you own, that is your home. Um, I want you to think about this place as yours. And doing that with people who make things, who are thinking about new ways of making and being, is, I think, really core to our mission in labs. Um, are you all familiar with the writer Anne Lamont? Um, She's got a story about writing that I love. My older brother, who was 10 years old at the time, was trying to get a report on birds written that he'd had three months to write, which was due the next day. Uh, we were out at our family cabin, and he was at the kitchen table close to tears, surrounded by binder paper and pencils and unopened books on birds, immobilized by the hugeness of the task ahead. Then my father sat down beside him, put his arm around my brother's shoulder, and said, bird by bird, buddy. Just take it bird by bird. <laughs> There's no magic to this work. Um, there's just the long, hard slog of trying things. And the potential for what we could do is infinite. So we need to get comfortable with it never being enough. And um, this is our life's work. And one day we'll be done, but it won't be finished. Um, and that's just going to have to be OK. 
This is not from the collections. <laughs> Um, I do want to talk for a minute or two about friendship and how that relates to scale. Um, everything good in my life has happened because of friendship. I have a job at the Library of Congress because a friend of mine thought of me when they saw the posting and told me to apply. Um, and the Library of Congress is good training ground for that because people never leave. Um, people, like, I think the average age of a current incumbent of a job is close to 30 years. That's not at retirement, that's of a current person. And um, even when people retire, they often come back and volunteer. And so uh, a friend of mine calls, uh, says it's like the Battlestar Galactica. It's like, you, like you're, on a, you're on a spaceship hurtling through space. Like the person that you've had this conversation with, you'll have the same conversation with 15 years from now. And, and so you better be nice, because people will remember that, you know? <laughs> um, it's, and that's true for the Library of Congress, but it's also true for our field. So when you guys are at professional meetings and you look around, how many of those people do you know from like 10 years ago, right? Um, and um, one of the best piece of, uh, pieces of advice I ever got um, about picking your career is to pick your career by the people that you like. So if you think that you want to be, um, you want to work on the stock market, that's, that's where you want to go, go hang out in the bars that stockbrokers go to. And if you like that energy, if you like those people, then that's good. But if you don't, realize that you will spend the rest of your life with those people. So pick your career by the kinds of people that you like to be around. And I think, like, man, do we have that in spades and libraries? It is wonderful to work here. The people are amazing. And I feel really lucky to have stumbled into this, because I got that advice after I picked my job. Um, that's, that's OK. Uh, and we've got a tough road ahead of us. Um, we, we think that we have gone through the hard times. but. Um, like, I'm sorry to say we haven't. We're still in the early days of the disruption that computation is going to bring to our profession. Um, and I think we can see that in, our, in physical sciences and the mathematics, right? They're further along than we are. Um, and they're still kind of, they're, you know, it's petering out there, uh, the disruption. I think we are, we're just at the very beginning. Um, I'd like to tell you about um, a time I went to talk to a, a group of scholars about the work we were doing to try to um, support digital humanities research at the Library of Congress. And the reception was really, really ranged from people who were like, great, I've got a specific research need that I need your help with, to I'm interested, I'd like to learn more, to outright hostility. Um, so there were the, uh, one person stood up and said, you're just trying to turn us all into physicists. Another person said, I love the smell of books. Don't take my books away from me. Um, and it was a really hard conversation, because I don't want to do any of those things, right? I just want to give you tools that, um, that you might find useful. Um, and in, when we're having those kinds of difficult conversations, I need to remember to focus on who's listening, because I'm not going to convince that person. And I, I don't need to, right? But I do need to convince the person that's sitting here that's not talking to be a little bit more curious. Um, so friendship is going to be what gets us through these hard times. Um, and we need to invite people in. Invite people into the tent. Look around and see who's missing, and grab them, and bring them in. Um, one theme in ev everything I talked about during the um, stuff we're working on is um, that everything we've accomplished has been through the generosity and support of our friends and colleagues. Um, Labs is a perfect example of that. It's a, we only have, there's just four of us um, in terms of staff, but everything we do is a collaboration. The Labs, con the labs con concept itself was created in collaboration with just about every human being at the library. Um, we spent a month getting coffee with people and presenting at staff meetings and refining our concept. The idea of a Labs came from staff members who are long gone now, some of them. Um, the Labs website and, and the API was written by a whole different team of people at the library called Web Services. Uh, the Jupyter Notebooks were written in collaboration with developers working on the repository. Uh, the Congressional Data Challenge was, had help from um, our technical staff and the Congressional Research Service, and it leaned heavily on the help from the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Government Publishing Office, and that's just the first three slides. Uh, so I don't, I don't believe in genius, and I don't believe in paradigm shifts. I believe in incremental progress, in kindness, and in a culture that encourages us to share. Thank you. Did you leave this for me? <laughs> that was fantastic, Kate. Thank you so much. I, uh, not to extend the baseball talk, 
too long, but uh, I have to say I think that was probably the best pinch hit since Kirk Gibson in 1988. <laughs> Thank you. Right? And for a Giants fan, that's hard to talk about, but that was fantastic. So much to think about and, um, and so much to inspire us um, for what is, you know, an incredible amount of work ahead, but doing it, as you said, with friends and colleagues. What better joy could there be to take on really important problems and, and important issues for the future um, with people that you uh, trust and admire and enjoy working with? So um, we will um, have some time for some questions. I remind you again, this is, I think, being live streamed. I hope being live streamed if, uh, and certainly archived for the future um, for uh, 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 public availability. So know that as you come up to the micro microphones. Um, and Kate has agreed to take some questions and comments, so. Hello again. <laughs> I, I mean, 45 minutes is a lot of Kate time, so if you don't have any questions, it's okay. <laughs> Hi, Kate. Um, thank you for that. That was really um, a lot to think about, as Chris said. You've talked about the need for more and the desire for more serendipity and talked about iteration. Can you say a couple of words about um, how the lab chooses which of those projects, which of those iterations to pursue? Um, I think part of that overwhelm, that feeling of not being anxious about how much there is to do is, which directions do we go first? Can you talk to us about your process and your organization? Yeah, I think um, that's a great question. Um, it, because we're so new, I think as we, as we age, those processes will um, become more robust and you know, we'll have some uh, way to systematically think about what projects might be the most uh, impactful. Um, but in the beginning, it was really, um, like I said, things that might have impact and things that we thought were possible. Um, but as we, um, as we progress, I think the possibilities become greater. And also what's possible becomes more, more greater. So that's um, two competing factors in a way. Hi, Kate. I'm uh, Kari Smith, the Institute Archivist here at MIT Libraries. Hey, Kate. Um, so one of the things I, was, I, I really was struck by was your idea on this idea of um, struggling to explain the scale of our collections. And as an archivist, obviously, that's one of the huge things, because it's always the closed stacks generally stored somewhere completely different. Um, and I was thinking about both the need for that information in terms of sort of funding infrastructure, what are we doing, how do we keep doing new, interesting, discovery types of things, and then also um, trying to get things that can explain the scale in an interesting way when we don't have a lot of information about the content. And so I just, I'm curious about kind of what you've thought about at Labs, kind of how you're doing that, because it, that's such a powerful, important thing to do, and I'm really interested in, I think, as a challenge, it's a, it, it is a big challenge that we have. Yeah, thank you for that. I think um, both of those things are um, challenging. So. Um, from the funding perspective, like I said, so much of the energy and dollars come into are just to maintain or to maintain our growth, right? And so doing new and interesting projects is um, sort of competes with that. And uh, you know, it's 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 a challenge. It's a challenge to carve out a section for that new and new exciting things. And also, like you said, to um, to tell our story to tell what the library has, what you might find there. Um, because it's so big, it's really hard to do. And um, I think that second thing is um, something that we've been working really hard on. And um, I think it's through talks like this. But um, I don't know of a more systematic way that you can wrap your head around the place. But if you think of one, um, tell me, because I, I would love to, love to do it. <laughs> Yeah, hi, it's, uh, my name's Phil Bourne, I'm at the University of Virginia. Um, I was thought, found your talk very inspiring, thank you. Thank you. Um, I have to say, so I was thinking about the, the human engagement, uh, which is, as you've highlighted, is so important. And you sort of talked about two extremes, the crowdsourcing piece and then uh, individual artists and individuals who are, are participating. 
But what I'm seeing, I, I ran a data science institute, and there would be enormous interest in, from those students to actually really engage in some of the activities uh, through internships. And you kind of touched on it, but I'm, I think there's so much potential there, either paid or unpaid, to bring people in to do the kinds of things, because there is so much to do, as you're pointing out. And I, I'm just think, trying to see how academic institutions could help with the mechanism to make that happen. Yeah, I think we're uh, very interested in figuring out what kinds of partnerships might be possible to get students in. I think the, um, the data sets we have are so rich. And um, I think also um, the place is so interesting. It's filled with interesting um, and neat people that um, I think students get a lot of, their, get a lot of value um, of their time there. Um, thinking about mechanisms for getting people paid uh, is challenging. We don't have a lot of funding to do that. But if we could figure out ways that um, we could work out some funding mechanism, I think that would be really exciting. I think we're definitely, we are def you know, this goes for anybody, we're definitely happy to talk about this. Uh, we would love to open our doors as wide as possible. Um, so if you've got some ideas, we should, we should chat. Hi, Kate. Christine Borgman, UCLA, and it's a, an honor to work with you on the LC Scholars Council, too. Um, I want to pick up on what you had said about, uh, with your example of, of the work and the web archiving, of moving from models of thinking about data and documents coming in as packages and things where the package goes in, the package goes back out intact. Uh, and you know, all through the data science world, we're thinking about how do you unpack it, how do you integrate it, how do you think about things like the FAIR principles, which you didn't mention yet, I'm sure, uh, the findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. Because even the way you get deposit collections does not model well with the FAIR principles. How do we get you know, sort of conceptually in libraries from the package idea that's been around for centuries to this opening up, this, this deconstruction, this reintegration. And then also, you know, as an educator, we need to bring a new kind of professional in who's thinking much more broadly about the nature of knowledge, too. Yeah, I think that's really right. And in some ways, I think OAIS has done great damage to how we structure our information in libraries. Um, I th think... Um, uh, copyright limits our ability to deliver information as packages to people who aren't um, on site. And I, I'm really interested in the Hathi Trust Research Center's um, idea of data capsules. And um, we have enor an enormous amount of material that's not accessible for to people who aren't on site. And I think a great example of this is our audio, um, our audio collection, which is, so there's no, no commons for audio for a long time. Um, things don't age into the commons. Um, in, in audio format for a while now. Um, I think you know, we'll, we'll have been retired by the time that happens. But um, are there ways that we could allow people to search the collection and to find it and to poke through it without consuming it? The non-consumptive use, I think, is really interesting. Um, also, um, you know, virtualization is, is really important. And we're actually um, working with UVA on, um, no, sorry, uh, I'm getting a little bit of field. Um, yeah, I think, I think you're right. Um, I think this, this idea of like chunks that come in and then chunks that come out is not a model that's going to work for us um, for very long, um, or maybe still isn't. Yeah. Hi, Kate. I'm Suzanne Lenz with the Harvard Library of Technology. I really loved hearing what you had to say about putting serendipity back into the library. And uh, in higher ed, we're always very conscientious about the time of our researchers and trying to give them the most efficient search of finding what they need, uh, and that's been our focus. Have you given any thought to like how we can sort of weave in some of that serendipitous delight without getting in the way of efficiency for our researchers? Wow, that's hard. Yeah, <laughs> that's, um, you know, I, when I talk about serendipity in libraries, I, it's partly just selfish. I mean, I just, you know, as a person who kind of like likes to wander around and learn things, um, I think that's a really core constituency for libraries, um, and I, um, I mean, maybe they're maybe they're, they shouldn't be married. I mean, maybe we serve the person with the very specific research purpose. Um, but I know that um, when when we uh, provide reference answers, so if you if you go to ask a librarian, um, you can send a there's a web form you can ask a question of any of our reference staff. Um, the responses they give are really excuse me really well thought out and quite comprehensive. 
And I think, um, you know, they will target the research question, but also give ancillary resources. Um, I think that, that could be a way. And I al also with the crowdsourcing, um, I think we might find if, if we do it right, I think what we could end up with is a lot of stuff that's available for crowdsourcing and people with specific research needs um, and they want to be able to make this searchable, um, but it's not ready yet. They can, you know, ask their students to help or they can do it themselves or they could promote it on their own social media. So um, they're in the process, while they're using knowledge, they're in the process of, they're, they're meaning making and making knowledge at the same time. Hi, I'm Darcy Duke. I work here in the MIT libraries in the UX and web services group. And I thought it was really fascinating, this inviting artists and others in to, you know, not just waiting for people to come and use it. And I was wondering if any, there was, any of the things that they'd done or that they wanted to do has changed uh, either how you think or how you might present like some of these APIs and y you know, cause a lot of it is how do we make the right thing so that people can do things? So has it actually had an effect on what you're making? That's a great question and it totally has. And um, if, it, if, it, if it didn't, we, we were doing it, we would have been doing it wrong, right? Because we, um, you know, we actually the API we made for our own use. So it wasn't in, it originally intended to be published it was an internal, um, you know, just for development purposes. And um, we realized that it worked as a, you know, a mechanism for getting information about collections, so we decided to publish it. So obviously it wasn't even designed for the purpose that we're using it for now. But I also think that um, that is really one of the benefits of the way that we're engaging with um, makers um, is um, because we, this is sort of a new way of providing information for our, our institution. Um, like bulk data, I mean, new in like the past 10, 10 years or so. Um, we still, we need um, feedback from the people who are using it to understand how to do it in, in optimally. Um, so that, that, and I think Laura Rubel is a great example of that. So she, she came and she said, I'll document the API. We were like, thank you, because it has no documentation. And so she, as she was documenting it, found a couple of things and worked with developers to make some changes. Um, and it was a great partnership. And I think, um, Open source, I think, is the best example of this kind of model. So um, the Chronicling America uh, web application is, um, was avail is available open source. And we have collaborators from across the country who um, help us with that. And so I think of um, that kind of work as being really compelling because it reduces the separation between um, the library and the users. And um, it sort of makes it more, more smoothed out kind of spectrum, and especially as a government agency, um, reducing the barriers between government and citizen citizens is, a, is something that we're really excited about. Thank you. So once again, thank you so much, Kate. That was really fantastic. Um, and sets us up well to, to spend the, the next day and a half talking about those grand challenges in scholarly discovery. Um, that balance between encouraging wonder and surfing and, and, and in fact, to some extent, slowing down and taking pleasure in learning and new things and discovering new things, balancing that with, uh, in fact, what is a very real need for researchers to maximize time and get what they need. And there are some grand challenges in figuring out what the right balance and what kind of uh, tools and mechanisms and, and uh, uh, what we need to know to even figure out how to create that kind of balance in a way that um, furthers, um, you know, our understanding of the planet and the people who live here, um, which is what research, I think, is all about. So thank you again, Kate. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you to all of you who, um, who joined us this morning. Um, one more time, please uh, join me in thanking Kate for her fantastic talk. And those of you who are participating in the summit, um, if you would gather outside at the registration table in five or 10 minutes, we'll head over to the hotel for the rest of our journey together. Thanks. <laughs>